Welcome everyone to the Center for the Women of New York Career Workshop Series. Today's workshop is on the topic of sexual harassment in the workplace. And our guest speaker is Orlando Torres. The Center for the Women of New York helps women overcome financial, violence, social, wellness, and legal issues by raising awareness and advocating for full gender equality for women, understanding their needs, and connecting them with the CWNY services, nonprofit partner organizations, and public resources to aid, uplift, and address their challenges. We currently have two locations, one in Fort Totten Bayside and the other at Queensboro Hall, Kew Gardens, both in Queens. Our current services and programs include referrals and advocate program, financial literacy workshop series, career workshop series, women in crisis support group, caregiver support group, one-on-one -on -one tax preparation assistance, gardening and sustainability workshops, conversational ESL class, legal support team, yoga classes, self-esteem workshops, women's issues think tank. If you'd like to view recordings of past uh, career se series workshops and other programs that we've recorded, and uh, also our PowerPoints are at cwny.org slash past hyphen events. Your questions are so important to us. So please use the chat box at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions. They will be addressed at the end of our guest speaker's presentation. If you dialed in, email your questions to events at cwny.org and we will also include them in the Q&A at the end of our presenter's program. So today's topic, sexual harassment in the workplace, is presented by Orlando Torres, Director of the Bronx Community Service Center for the New York City Commission on Human Rights. Welcome, Orlando Torres. Thank you so much, uh, Victoria, for that introduction. Um, I wanted to uh, just quickly say thanks um, uh, to the uh, Center for Women in New York for having us. Uh, I believe this is a um, workshop that we've done in the past with other staff, and I'm really looking forward to um, you know, doing this again here today. Um, and so I just wanna make sure that everyone can see my uh, screen slides. Um, if that's the case, then I will get started. Let me see. If, okay. Okay. So uh, I'm going to talk about um, discrimination in employment and specifically sexual harassment and how that is protected in the New York City human rights law. And I'll be doing a, an overview and a brief history of the New York City Commission on Human Rights, because a lot of folks don't know that we exist and don't know what we do. Um, we'll talk about protections against discrimination in employment um, under the law, how to contact the commission, and what the process is for bringing a case to us. This is just a quick uh, picture of some of our staff, most of our staff um, at the commission. And so, um, you know, what's important to know is that the City Commission on Human Rights, uh, what we do is we enforce the city's human rights law and educate the public on their rights and obligations under that law. And so our mandate is to prevent and protect against discrimination in New York City. It's a very large mandate. We're not gonna talk about the entire law today, but we are gonna get pretty specific around employment protections and specifically sexual harassment. Just a little background on the commission. Um, we began as the Committee on Unity founded by Mayor LaGuardia all the way back in 1944. And the goal was to make New York City a place where people of all races and religions could work and live side by side in harmony, having mutual respect for each other and where democracy was a living reality. And so um, in 1955, Mayor Wagner named the committee a full city agency and renamed it the Commission on Intergroup Relations. And then in 62, it was renamed the, um, the Commission on Human Rights. So 
Um, we are a city agency. We're just like the NYPD or HPD or the DOE, right? Um, biggest difference is that we're a lot smaller than those agencies. Um, and so how we are structured is we have a community relations bureau, which promotes equality, understanding, and mutual respect amongst all New Yorkers. And we work with schools, community groups like yours, faith-based communities, and many other groups to educate the public and lead programs and trainings and workshops like this one to, you know, again, educate people that there is a human rights law specific to the five boroughs and that they can um, bring cases of discrimination to us that we will take for free, right? Our lawyers will take for free. And so the law enforcement bureau are those lawyers. They are the ones who accept complaints and initiate investigations of discrimination or harassment. Um, the law enforcement bureau can also file commission initiated cases, meaning cases that we believe are discrimination without someone having to come to us and that we will take to court. And then um, we will bring all those cases before the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings to conciliate um, those settlements. Uh, so those are the, the, the two biggest um, bureaus within our agency. There's a much smaller bureau called the Office of Mediation and Conflict Resolution, and they provide uh, mediation services to parties involved in cases, right? So cases that are referred by LEB, um, you know, they can go into this office, but both parties must agree to mediation. And this office is independent and smaller than the other commission offices to ensure neutrality. Then finally, you have the office of the chair. Uh, this is where they issue the final decisions, orders, and legal enforcement guidance. Um, they draft policy and legislation that then can get passed or not passed by city council um, because this is a city law. And they engage in policy discussions with commission stakeholders. You know, often that will be the city council or the mayor's office. So what exactly is the human rights law, right? You have a sense of how our agency is structured. Um, it's important to know what the law is exactly. So the law prohibits discrimination in several areas. Those areas are employment, public accommodations, housing, discriminatory harassment, and bias-based profiling by law enforcement. We're only gonna be focusing on employment today. I can always come back and do a presentation on the other areas another time. Uh, that's literally what my job is and what our jobs are here uh, at the, uh, the in the borough offices. Um, but these are the, the main areas of the law. And so just a couple things to keep in mind if you're wondering how to bring a case to us or, or think that there might even be a case that you're aware of. Uh, in most cases, the last incident of discrimination has to have occurred within the past year in order to file a complaint with us. There is an exception. Uh, which is relevant for what we're going to be talking about today for gender-based harassment the time period to file those cases is three years and we only cover incidents in new york city so you have to either be working or living in new york city to file a case in one of these areas and for purposes of today's conversation um we're going to be talking about incidents that happen in new york city so if you work in new york city you can bring a case to us if you're experiencing workplace discrimination or sexual harassment. If you don't live in New York City, that's okay as long as you work there, right? Um, some more information about our law. In order to establish discrimination, you generally have to show that the discrimination occurred and that a certain relationship exists between the people involved to be covered under our law, right? So for the vast majority of our cases, the lawyers are looking for this kind of relationship, whether that's employee and employer, tenant and landlord, or a customer and an employee or an owner of a public accommodation, right? Discriminatory harassment and bias-based profiling are a little different in that they don't need that established relationship uh, as frequent, um, and they are covered in other presentations. So a couple other things we wanna um, define uh, before we get into employment protections and sexual harassment. Um, what is a disability under the city human rights law? A disability is any physical, medical, mental, or psychological impairment or history of uh, or record of that impairment. And a person with a disability must be provided with a reasonable accommodation. And that's relevant, especially in employment, 
in housing and in public accommodations. Gender, right? How does the city define gender? Very important, obviously, uh, especially when it comes to sexual harassment. So gender includes actual or perceived sex, gender identity, and gender expression, including a person's actual or perceived gender-related self-image, appearance, behavior, expression, or other gender-related characteristics, regardless of the sex assigned to that person at birth, right? So we're including gender expression and gender identity in our definition of gender. So we're gonna get into some employment, uh, uh, employment discrimination and talk some about the protected classes, which are very important. And obviously we'll be focusing a lot on those classes as they're related to sexual harassment as well. So protected classes under our law are basically reasons why someone should never be discriminated against, right? So you're looking here at the list of protected classes in employment. So when it comes to looking for a job, maintaining a job, or um, being or leaving a job, whether you're being you know released or something is happening, it should never be, you should never be having to experience different treatment because of one or more of these protected classes. So whether it's age, um, you know, color, disability, gender or gender identity, your sexual orientation, uh, sexual and reproductive health decisions, your status as a victim of domestic violence, sexual violence or stalking. None of these are ever reasons to be denied a job, to be treated differently while you're interviewing for a job, to be treated differently or denied um, basic services or accommodations while you're at a job, or definitely not to be fired, right? Who is protected under our law? So as I mentioned, uh, you can file a case with us as long as you work in New York City and your employer has four or more employees or one or more domestic workers, right? The last incident of discrimination has to have occurred within the past year, except for that gender-based harassment, right? Which is the three years. And then um, you can also always look into filing with the New York State Division on Human Rights. They are a state office that basically do what we do on a state level. If let's say, for example, you work in Yonkers or Long Island or New Rochelle, anywhere, you know, north of the Bronx, essentially, um, that's in New York State, but it's not the five boroughs. So um, I mentioned your employer needing to have four or more employees um, if you want to file an employment discrimination case and which would include sexual harassment at, at work, right? Um, so how we determine that four or more number is we count the employers themselves. So like the boss, for lack of a better term, uh, we would be counting independent contractors and freelancers and employers, parents, spouse, domestic partner or child, if they are also working there. Um, and employees do not need to work all in the same location or even in New York City in making the calculation. The employee that needs to work in New York City is the one bringing the case to us. So all kinds of employees are covered under our law, whether uh, so interns, whether they are paid or unpaid, undocumented workers, part-time or probationary workers, domestic workers, independent contractors, freelancers are all covered. Um, this is an example of a, a really new addition to our law. I believe it was added in March of last year. Um, domestic workers are now covered under our law, right? So anyone who employs a domestic worker in New York City is considered an employer, right? Um, domestic workers have the right to be free from discrimination and harassment, which includes sexual harassment. They are protected against retaliation from their employer, and they have the right to reasonable accommodations. And uh, there is no four or more employee requirement when it comes to domestic workers, because rarely is someone hiring more than one, right? And so we want to make sure that they're still protected, even though they are in a um, a very small kind of work environment in terms of um, number of employees. So some protections to keep in mind, uh, you know, our law begins at the hiring process, right? So job advertisements can seek candidates with certain qualifications, but they can't list a preference based on a protected class, right? So we shouldn't see job advertisements saying, um, 
you know, if you're dealing or, or even like statements in job interviews saying like, if you're dealing with a stalker or if you have like a sexual case, sexual harassment case in court, you know, we can't work with you at this time, that's illegal, right? Any kind of preference based on protected class in hiring is illegal in New York City. The example we always give is like, if you're hiring for a restaurant, let's, let's say it's a Peruvian cuisine restaurant, your ad can say waiter or waitress with experience in Peruvian cuisine. That's perfectly fine. What your job ad should not say is Peruvian waiter wanted, right? Because you're hiring based on skills and qualifications, not on nationality. You don't need to be Peruvian to understand Peruvian cuisine. And so, um, you know, statements like that would be would, would not be legal, right? Any kind of questions about membership in a protected class during an interview are not permissible. And on the other end of it, right, you cannot be fired for being a member of a protected class. So you can't be fired because you're a woman or you're pregnant or gay or Latina or dealing with a stalking situation or, or a, sec a domestic violence case or something like that. You cannot be paid differently than other workers because you are a member of a protected class, right? Um, so that would, often we would see like workers of one immigration status being paid less than others with a different status that's illegal in New York City. Um, other terms and conditions and privileges of employment. So things like promotions, assignments, uh, work scheduling or hours or the availability of accommodations, those can't be given or uh, restricted based on uh, someone's membership in a protected class. Age discrimination in employment is part of um, what we protect here at the Commission on Human Rights. It's a violation of any covered, uh, of the law of, for any covered employer or employment agency or labor organization to discriminate against job applicants based on their actual or perceived age. So our law is broad and reflective of the city's commitment to eliminate all forms of discrimination. Um, and so because of that, we offer more protections against age discrimination in the workplace than the state or federal laws do. Um, discrimination based on race, it's illegal for employers to treat you differently or deny you opportunities because of your race or assumptions or stereotypes about racial identity. Um, so for example, an employer prohibiting natural hairstyles, head coverings, um, you know, things closely associated with black people or bars or barring people from having such hairstyles, from having public facing roles is illegal, right? That's, that's employment discrimination uh, under our law. Salary history law. So just quick note, employers cannot ask applicants questions about or make statements intended to solicit information about an applicant's current or prior earnings or benefits, right? So essentially, um, if you're in a job interview and an employer asks you what you make at your current job or what you used to make at a previous job, they are in violation of the law. And that is uh, in part because we all know that there is a serious uh, gender wage gap, right? Uh, in, in overall, women are paid less than men, uh, not just in New York City, but uh, in the country for doing the same work. And part of that is because if you start uh, a certain group of people at a lower range, even if they, as they rise up, they are going to be at that lower range, right, than other people that started at a different range for the same work. So we want to try to eliminate that gap or shrink it as much as possible. And this is one way to do it, right? So asking applicants current or former employers or employees for uh, an applicant's current or prior earnings or benefits is also illegal, as is searching public records to learn about that applicant's, applicant's current or prior earnings or benefits. Uh, this, is, this is the most recent addition to our law. Uh, this came into effect uh, November 1st of last year. Any employer with four or more employees or one or more domestic worker that advertises jobs in New York City must include a good faith salary range for every job promotion and transfer opportunity advertised. What that means is essentially the employers must include a minimum and a maximum salary on their job advertisements. So it's no longer okay for a job posting to say, uh, we are hiring at the rate of $15 an hour and up, or we are a salary is up to $50,000. There's gotta be a, a, um, a low and a high, uh, number, right, attached to these job advertisements. 
Um, protections for pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions are also part of our law. So the human rights law requires accommodations for pregnant employees. Being denied a job or fired because of pregnancy violates the law. Uh, pregnant workers are entitled to reasonable accommodations. They simply need to ask. Uh, they may not get the specific accommodation they request, but it's never wrong to ask. And the employer must always engage in a conversation about it. So some um, you know, commonly uh, seen accommodations requested are things like lifting restrictions or temporary changes in job duties, um, seats for cashiers who have to stand all day, additional bathroom breaks. An employer, employee does not need to bring a doctor's note to their employer. Uh, and employers must provide this notice um, of pregnancy accommodations at work to all of their employees. And they should also have it posted um, somewhere where em all employees can see it at, at the job site. If anyone needs this posting, uh, we can provide that. Uh, lactation accommodations. Employers must find space for a lactation room and establish a written lactation room policy. Uh, under the law, a lactation room is a sanitary place other than a restroom that can be used to express breast milk free from intrusion. And that includes at a minimum, an electrical outlet, a chair, a surface on which to place a breast pump and other personal items and nearby access to running water. Employers must provide a reasonable time for their employees to pump. And if a space is not available at the exact location of, of employment, the employer should be working with the employee to find an accommodation nearby that meets the employee's needs. A lactation room accommodation written policy should be distributed to each employee upon their hiring. And we have um, like template uh, lactation accommodation policies that any employer can, can kind of work with as like a first draft and, and just tailor to, to their specific um, situation. Uh, gender identity and gender expression is also protected under our law. So transgender and gender non-conforming persons are covered under the human rights law. What that means is that under the, under the law, employees are entitled to use the bathroom consistent with their gender identity. They're entitled to use their personal name, title, and pronoun and dress and groom themselves in a manner appropriate to their gender identity or expression. Some best practices for employers to keep in mind are, you know, things like always, um, you know, asking, are we uh, respecting the self-identity of all employees here? Are we avoiding sex stereotyping at work? Remembering that third-party bias or discomfort does not excuse discrimination. And are we using correct pronouns for our employees? Um, national origin and immigration status is also protected in employment. So all employees in New York City, regardless of immigration status, are protected under the human rights law. Workers cannot be paid less just because of their immigration status. They cannot be threatened with deportation and they're entitled to equal treatment by the employers, regardless of the language they speak, what country they come from, or whether or not they speak with an accent. Credit discrimination, um, so credit history is also a part of our law. It's illegal under the New York City human rights law for an employer to request either orally or in writing or use a job applicant's credit history as part of the job application process. Employers cannot ask you about your credit, debt, late payments, student loans, child support, bankruptcies, or ask you to sign a document to obtain your credit score. It's illegal to request or use a current employee's credit history in making these employment decisions. There are exceptions. And so the exceptions in, under our law usually relate to jobs that have to do with law enforcement. Right. So if you're applying to become a police officer or a school safety officer, they can ask um, certain credit history questions. I'm going to skip a couple of slides here just to make sure we are um, good on time. Um, caregiver protections. Um, so the law defines a caregiver as a person who provides direct and ongoing care for a minor child um, or a care recipient. Um, a care recipient is a person with a disability who's a covered relative and relies on that caregiver for medical care to meet the daily livings. Um, but this law does not provide reasonable accommodations for caregivers. So that's something to keep in mind. If, if you need, um, you know, certain kind of work hours tailored to your needs at home, if you're a caregiver, that needs to be worked out 
prior to your start date at a place of employment. More thing. Okay. Um, sexual and reproductive health decisions are protected under our law. So they, these include, but are not limited to fertility related medical procedures, sexually transmitted disease prevention, testing and treatment, uh, family planning services uh, and counseling such as birth control, uh, drugs and supplies, emergency contraception, sterilization procedures, pregnancy testing and abortion. So employment discrimination based on an individual's sexual and reproductive health decisions is illegal in New York City. So we talked a little bit about reasonable accommodations in employment. Uh, I just wanna make sure um, that everyone's clear on who can request these. So um, the law provides certain employees with the rights to reasonable accommodations. These are employees with disabilities, pregnant employees, employees who are victims of domestic violence, sexual violence, or stalking, um, and, and employees with religious observances. Uh, these employees are entitled to reasonable accommodations as long as they don't cause undue hardship to the business. Every situation is unique. We don't apply like a formula to every case, right? Um, every situation is different, has, uh, you know, important details that could um, require that we mandate the employer uh, provide an accommodation or we might discover that the employer simply can't because it, because it will cause undue hardship. Um, and so that's important to keep in mind, but these are the employees that should never be afraid or feel uncomfortable asking their employers for reasonable accommodations. We determine undue hardship by looking into, um, the nature and the cost of the accommodation. If there is a cost, uh, the financial resources of the employer, which include tax records, financial statements, depreciation, and any documents covering revenues and expenses. So some examples of reasonable accommodations would be um, assistive uh, reading devices for low vision employees, temporary reduction in, in lifting heavy boxes for pregnant employees, a shifting a schedule to avoid a conflict with religious observance um, for, for, uh, for religious employees and relocating employees for safety if they're dealing with a domestic violence situation. So I want to talk now about sexual harassment in the workplace, uh, and then we can cover um, what it might look like in places of public accommodation um, and um, so on and so forth. Um, so under the law, sexual harassment is a form of gender discrimination. Uh, and that is because gender uh, discrimination is when a person is treated less well because of their gender, and that gender includes gender identity and gender expression. And so the harasser can be of any gender, right? Um, so it's important to know the law covers, um, you know, all of this as it defined because the, the definition of gender is what it is. So some examples of sexual harassment um, can look like unwelcome or inappropriate touching of employees or customers, like if you're in a place of public accommodation. Uh, in housing, it can also look like a housing provider, you know, doing these things, right? Um, whether it's like you're looking for an apartment or you're looking for a super, a building super or a porter to um, provide housing services that you're paying for, right? Um, it can also be threatening adverse action after someone refuses a sexual advance, right? Making lewd or sexual comments about someone's appearance, body, or style of dress. Um, conditioning promotions or other opportunities uh, at work on sexual favors, making sexist remarks or derogatory comments based on gender, displaying pornographic images on computers, emails, cell phones, etc., whether that's at work or in a housing situation, um, or maybe like in a place of public accommodation that's often frequented, you know, by the same people. Um, you know, these are all examples of sexual harassment that have been cases brought to us in the past that we have, um, you know, successfully taken to court. Sexual harassment is always connected to gender, right? And that's why that, that uh, definition of gender under the city law is so important. Um, 
it may include sexual behavior, obviously, if it's sexual harassment, but not all gender discrimination is sexual harassment, right? So this behavior, it can be offensive, threatening, demeaning, embarrassing, or something similar. And it can, and sexual harassment um, can and oftentimes does overlap with other forms of discrimination, right? And so um, as we're looking at cases and we're, you know, investigating and interviewing people bringing cases to us, we're often looking at all the layers, right? So, so oftentimes someone will come with us and say, come to us and say, you know, I believe I'm being um, sexually harassed at work, right? And then, but when we get into a deeper conversations and talk to more people, we realize that they're also, they also may be experiencing age discrimination or race discrimination on top of, you know, or intertwined with that sexual harassment. And so when we bring a case to court, we want to bring all of those things to make it as strong a case as possible. Um, uh, and so, you know, that was just something that that's important. And that's whether it's at work, whether it's a housing case, um, whether it's a, uh, a situation where someone is dealing with sexual harassment in a place of a public accommodation, right? Which could be, which is a public accommodation is essentially anywhere, uh, you know, any place outside of your home or work that provides a service or a public good, right? So it can be, um, you know, a store, a McDonald's, a movie theater, a public park. It doesn't have to be publicly run to be a place of public accommodation because even a privately run restaurant or a store is providing that service to the public, right? And so they are covered under the law and they, um, you know, cannot be allowing their, for there to be sexual harassment both in their environment um, and as well as like among their employees and the people who work there. So a quick note on retaliation, because this is an important part of our law too. It's an additional violation of the law for any employer, housing, or public accommodation provider to retaliate against an employee, a tenant, or a patron who opposes discrimination, who reports or files a complaint of discrimination, either internally or externally, or who cooperates, assists, or participates in an investigation, proceeding, or hearing related to actions prohibited under the human rights law. So with that, this is important because this is how we um, are able to provide some protection for people who are worried about coming toward to, uh, to us with a case, right? Which is totally natural and happens uh, quite often, right? If I am thinking about bringing a case, um, you know, against my employer, for example, let's say I feel that I am being sexually harassed at work, I can lose that original case, right? If 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 the commission investigates and decides that uh, I was not, um, you know, sexually harassed at work, they can they can do that. But if if within that time of investigation, when the commission is talking to my employer, talking to maybe my coworkers or myself, um, if they discover or if I if I am experiencing retaliation from my employer for initiating that case, so if they dock my work hours, if they change my schedule to make it really impossible for me to pick up my child. If they ask me questions about, um, you know, anything having to do with protected class, I can then bring a retaliation case against, my against that same employer. It's a separate case. And I can win that case, even if I lost the initial case, right? So uh, it's important for everyone to know that after bringing an initial case to us, you are protected um, from retaliation, and that's a separate case, whether it's an employer, a housing provider, or a public accommodation provider. So what can the commission do besides investigate these cases and take, it, take them to court? Well, we provide trainings like this one. We share training materials and answer questions in many different languages upon request. Um, when there are allegations of discrimination, that are reported to us, we can send letters to employers or housing providers, informing them of their obligations and protections under the law. We can investigate, um, you know, those housing providers and individuals as well, and we can file complaints. And so, uh, the commission can impose 
up to $125,000 in civil penalties for violations and up to a quarter million dollars for violations that are the result of willful, wanton, or malicious conduct. So important to keep in mind here that, um, you know, these are pretty large numbers, but they can get larger if, if there are multiple violations in a case, right? Um, so that is why we have often had uh, won cases of over a million dollars and, and so on and so forth. But um, we've also won cases where someone was awarded $2,000, right? Or even just an employer or a housing provider was mandated to attend a training, right? It, it's all situational. There is no formula. Um, everything is taken, you know, case for case, um, you know, on its merit. These penalties are in addition to the other remedies that include, but are not limited to ordering to provide the accommodation that was denied, mandated uh, attended, mandated trainings, back pay, emotional distress damages, and or other out-of-pocket expenses related to the discrimination. So um, in closing, I want to make sure everyone knows how to contact us, and I'm going to leave my contact information in the chat as well when I'm done. Um, so you can always call 311 and ask for the Commission on Human Rights, or you can call our info line, which is a little more direct because you're going to get straight to the Legal Enforcement Bureau's kind of queue of calls that they need to make uh, in return. And that info line number is 212-416-0197. And I'm going to leave that number in the chat as well. Um, you can check out our website for more information on the law. We have one page guides for employers, housing and public accommodation providers in many different languages. We have brochures, we have frequently asked questions and legal guidance. Um, the website is really the best place to get the most up-to-date information in uh, a lot of different languages uh, on our law. Um, so I would definitely encourage folks to check that out. And with that, I wanna thank everyone for attending. I'm going to stop sharing and open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Orlando. Um, we're very happy that you uh, joined the Center for the Women of New York. Um, and this is such a, an important presentation for, um, for our audience. And you know, like, I, I wanted to ask you, is there uh, any outreach, and, I, and I'm sorry, I'm jumping uh, on the questions so quickly. I'm sure that uh, um, you know other people may have questions as well. But um, we recently had an interview on a, a uh, Spanish-speaking um, uh, news channel, and we mm -hmm. got a lot of you know um, inquiries. I, I was wondering if do you have uh, language access uh, to all this information? And is there any, anything that uh, you do for populations that are not necessarily English speaking? Absolutely. Um, so um, I'll start with what I just ended with. Uh, everything that I just presented is in Spanish on our website. Um, right. It's also for the most part in French, um, Mandarin, uh, Russian, um, Bengali, Arabic, uh, and, 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 and even more, and, and, and some documents are, are in even uh, like more languages. We also, as a staff, have language capacity as well, right? So I can do presentations in Spanish. I supervise staff that can do presentations in Spanish, Arabic, sign language here, here in the Bronx, but citywide, we have um, French language capacity, uh, Bangla language capacity, um, and others. I believe we, I believe the staff in total speaks about uh, 27 different languages. Um, and so, you know, whether it's a presentation needed or just like maybe answering a question in email or having a phone call in, in another language, we can usually um, take care of it. Um, and then finally, speaking of phone calls, the other thing that um, we have available for anyone who comes to one of the borough offices and needs information in, in another language besides English. If the staff can't speak that language, we have um, language interpretation services that we can call on the phone and have someone on the phone basically do the interpretation for us, right? With the, with the mm -hmm. other person there 
so that we are able to answer in our strongest language, the information that they need and get it interpreted in their strongest language. So um, language capacity and access is a huge part of the law. And it's why mm -hmm. we really prioritize working with groups that do um, speak various languages and also hiring people with language capacity so that, you know, that, 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 um, that's just kind of built into who's working here. Um, because it, it, it absolutely, you need that in New York City. Um, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, well, thank you so much for that. Um, sure, sure. Are there, are there any questions in the chat, Lana or Victoria? And I, I just want to say hi to everyone. I didn't introduce myself at the beginning, um, but I, I am the president of the Center for the Women in New York. My name is Cecilia Venosta Weigel. And I want to thank uh, Victoria and Lana for, for covering this presentation. I was not uh, fully like 100% available earlier. So thank you so much, uh, you know, both for, for being here, sharing screen and, and introducing Orlando. Our pleasure. I just left my contact information in the chat. I'm going to leave the CCHR info line number in there as well. Thank you. Um, and I'll also like include this in an email to um, the Center for Women in New York staff so that you can just give it out to folks who whoever need. Um, oh, we have a question, it sounds like. Uh, Victoria, would you like to read it? Yes. I can't. Yeah. What type of employment opportunities are there in your office for an older person with a JD degree, but not admitted? Okay, so we don't, um, we don't, you know, we would be crazy to enforce the human rights law and discriminate based on age, right? So the age is irrelevant for anyone applying to any one of our open positions. I have to claim ignorance. I don't know what they mean by JD. Uh, Juris doctorate, um, that would be a, a law degree. Got it. Okay. Law degree, okay. But, uh, but I guess not licensed in the state of New York. Understood. That's interesting. Um, so uh, actually, the most openings at the commission right now are for attorneys. I don't know the requirements for, I don't know what they're looking for, f f you know, for those attorneys. I would encourage anyone um, interested in working with the commission, whether it's in the Legal Enforcement Bureau or Community Relations Bureau, go to our website and you're going to just go to the search bar on the website. I'll even, I'll put the website on here. You're going to go to the, I'll put it in the chat box. You're going to go to the search bar on our website and you're just going to type in jobs. And then when you do that, um, let me just put it in here. You type in jobs. First thing that's going to come up is a link to jobs and internships. Matter of fact, I'll I'll put that link in the in the chat box. That's a little quicker. That jobs and internships link will take you um, to kind of like a description of the jobs that we have open. And then towards the top of that page is the link to the New York NYC, uh, to the NYC.gov jobs page. Any city job, you have to create a, an NYC jobs account to apply for, right? Um, so we're, like when I'm at a job fair and people wanna give me resumes or give me cover letters, I don't take them because um, all of that information has to be uploaded and sent online. And you can only do it with a New York City um, jobs account. So you wanna create that account and then check out all the positions open, not just at the commission, but every city agency. So it's a really valuable account to have. Um, I really encourage anyone looking for work in New York City to create an account there because um, you're going to be able to view literally thousands of jobs and they are constantly adding new jobs and the city is looking to hire. <laughs> right. So now is the time to create this account and to just get very familiar with the agencies that you're interested um, and look at what's open. I would definitely also recommend if you're interested in an agency like ours or any other agency, look at the website. The website's gonna tell you what kind of jobs they're hiring, what kind of skills and qualifications they're, they're basically looking for. Um, 
So I, I, I hope that's helpful. We do have attorney positions open. I don't know the details of what what's required, so I wouldn't want to put anything uh, misleading out there. But the links I provided in the, in the chat um, should get you started. And if I could also add, New York City Department of Aging would be very helpful for this participant. Look at the newyorkcity.gov website and type in Department for the Aging. And they Absolutely. have targeted programs to guide older individuals in the job search and learning their marketability of their own skills because we don't even always know what valuable skills we have for employers. Absolutely. And if anyone had a problem with any employer and they like, you know, getting an interview, getting hired, and they believed it was because of their age, you circle back to us, right? Because that's exactly and, what. And Orlando, we, we do right. have that question come up a lot, um, aging uh, or yep. ageism. Uh, yep. So uh, thank you for bringing up that as a category and, and you know, advocating for anyone who feels discriminated because of their age. Absolutely. And I will say that uh, there is so much research out there that is showing that um, organizations that hire a vast range of ages are the successful ones. Sure. Mm -hmm. Can't all have newbies and no right. one with life experience. Yep. So um, that's in our favor now, all that research that's out there. Absolutely. Promote Absolutely. hiring older individuals with life experience. So if you would like to become a member, uh, you know, go to cwny.org um, slash membership. Uh, you can donate there as well. Um, you can follow us on social media. We're on uh, Twitter, um, Facebook, um, Instagram. And um, I forget, well, oh, and we have two locations that Victoria mentioned. We are in, uh, both of them are in Queens. One is in Bayside in Fort Totten Park. Uh, we opened last year and we're adding more and more programs. So keep checking, you know, the additional programs that we're adding. We will start a couple more programs uh, in person uh, in March. And uh, feel free to take a picture. I, I think Lana also put the information on in the chat. Thank you, Lana. And again, thank you for attending. And we hope that we see you in future events. Thank you again, Orlando. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. A very informative presentation. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Anytime.